the Lord. Good evening, everybody. Hey, you glad to be in the house of the Lord here tonight? Yeah, it's good to see everybody. Hey, was there anyone else that had snow this week? Anybody? All right, we have a few of you. Oh, yeah, there was a day this week I had a couple of inches uh, where I live. I mean, it was really something. But man, I tell you what, we know who loves God here tonight. Isn't it just a beautiful day out there? Praise God. Well, it's just a little calm before the good stuff right shows up praise the lord let's go ahead, let's stand to our feet are you ready to worship him here tonight isn't it good to be in church isn't it good to be together let's praise him father we glorify you tonight father we're just glad to be gathered in the name of jesus come on everybody hallelujah. let's praise him hallelujah let's praise jesus tonight father we bless you we love you and we honor you hallelujah let's all sing together here we go God, he reigns forever, and all the world will know his name, everyone together, sing the song of redeeming, I know that my redeemer lives, and now I stand on what he did, my savior, my savior lives. Every day, every day, a brand new chance to say, Jesus, you are the only way, my Savior, my Savior lives. Yes, he lives. Hallelujah. The King, the King has come from heaven, and darkness trembles at his name. Victory. And I know, I know that my 
Come on, everybody. Let's yes, praise Lord. him. Let's worship him here tonight. Let's lift our voices, lift our hands. Father, we're just so glad to be in the house of the Lord here tonight. Father, we're going to praise you. We're going to worship you. Father, we're going to rejoice at your word. We are gathered in the name of Jesus. Lord, we know that this is a sacred time together. We are just excited to be in our meeting time with you. Father, we bless you here tonight. We glorify you, yes. Lord. And Father, we just pray for our nation. Father God, we pray for those that are in civic authority. Father, we pray for the president. We pray for every congressman and woman. We pray for our senators, our Supreme Court, our state and local governments. Father, regardless of our political affiliations, Father, we pray that you would lead these individuals with wisdom and righteousness, that the gospel of Jesus Christ would have free course in America. Father, we pray that your will would be done in this coming election. Father, we pray that those uh, leaders, those politicians who are more closely aligned with your word, Father, we pray that they would get into office. Father, those that would respect and honor life, Father, those that would respect and honor the sacredness of your word. Father, we pray that your will is done, Father, in our nation. And we also pray for the men and women of our military and law enforcement. We are so grateful for them. Father, we pray for a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty in this nation. Lord, as your word tells us to pray for. And Father God, we're just going to rejoice tonight. Father, we all declare together that all Erie County shall be saved. Every man, woman, and child will know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Father, we're going to preach your word. We're going to rejoice and be glad. We thank you for a mighty harvest out of this land. And Lord, we just give you all the praise. All the glory in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone shouted, amen. Hey, before you're seated, turn around, find somebody. Let them know you're glad to see them here tonight. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Sure is good to see everybody here tonight. Everyone's just enjoying each other's company. Praise the Lord. Yeah, boy, they're still enjoying everybody's company here. Here we go. Man, we should just turn my mic off and go back to green for a few more minutes. Amen. Well, that's a good thing. 
It's a good thing to have a, a, a friendly church on your hands. Amen. Well, it's good to see everybody here tonight. You glad to be in church? Yes. Yeah, we enjoy being together. It's just so good to see a couple new faces here with us tonight. We welcome you to Family Church. For those of you that are visiting, my name is Pastor Tim Stallman. We're just so glad to have you. It just means the world that you could visit with us. We just invite you to take a moment. There's a gray welcome card there in your seat with you. If you wouldn't mind uh, taking a moment to fill that out, we certainly would appreciate that. Uh, please know that whenever you give us any information, here at the church. We do not sell it, distribute it, or share it with anybody. It stays right here with the church staff. Uh, we're very careful about that. We believe in protecting people's privacy and whatnot. I'm just going to send you a letter thanking you for being here. Uh, the only thing better than having you here tonight would be to have you here every Saturday at 6 p.m. We'd love to have you. If you're looking for a Bible teaching church, we'd love to be your church. And if you're wondering why right now we only have the Saturday night service, that's because I pastor two different church locations. I'm here in Erie on Saturday nights and I'm in Jamestown uh, on Sunday mornings. And so just so you understand why, it's not because of any different beliefs or anything that we have. Uh, praise the Lord. We believe that every day is a good day for church. Amen. Praise the Lord. So again, we just welcome you. If you wouldn't mind uh, 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 dropping that uh, welcome card in the offering when it goes by here in just a few moments. Uh, there's a couple of great ways to get connected to the church on that welcome card. Uh, we do have uh, our email devotional that goes out every Tuesday if you'd like you know some Bible teaching you know in your inbox you can sign up for that also we have a text communication service I personally send out those messages uh, all those numbers are secure in a system uh, uh, that we have uh, it's just a great way to get notifications from the church if there's ever a, a service time or a cancellation or something like that uh, but last but not least there is a space on the back of the gray card uh, for prayer needs and requests Again, we keep all that confidential, but just know this, as many times as you submit a prayer request, it will get prayed for. Amen. And church, whose job is it to make sure that our visiting guests feel warm and welcome? That's our job. Let's welcome them here tonight. So glad to have new faces with us. Praise the Lord. We know that God's got an awesome plan for your life, and we want to tell you about it right out of the Bible. Amen. Glory to God. Well, just a couple of quick things here uh, by means of announcements. We have Ask the Pastor Night coming up. It's just a few weeks. Yeah, praise the Lord. If you're new here and you're wondering, well, what's Ask the Pastor? Well, if you've ever had any, you know, uh, Bible questions or things in God's Word that stump you, whether they're curiosity questions or theological questions or doctrinal questions, uh, we want to give you a chance to uh, ask anything you want, and then I will uh, do my best. Now, most of the time, these questions will come in. I don't spend a whole lot of time ahead of time getting prepared, and so it's kind of a, a test on me to do my best to answer it right out of the Word of God. And so, but if you'd like to submit your questions a little beforehand, it might give me a little bit more time to uh, take a look at those. We have a box uh, over there on our Welcome Center. You can just anonymously fill out a question and we'll do our best to get to those at the event. That's Wednesday, November 9th. Now, I know Pastor Brad was here last week and he uh, announced you know, the, the correction of the date there. Just a reminder, we originally said the 5th, but it's gonna be Wednesday, November 9th, so it's gonna be midweek, and it's gonna be at 6.30 p.m. Uh, it, it's a really good time. We, we get a lot of questions, things that we don't usually get to talk about right in the service, so go ahead. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet at the welcome counter. Sign up so we can be prepared. Uh, we want to know how many uh, folks to uh, plan for. Praise the Lord. And we'll have a question and answer time. And then there will be some refreshments after that. Just like there is every Saturday night. Don't forget, we do have the refreshments. It's not a uh, uh, pay, you know, uh, for refreshments. It's not for sale. It's just a time to go fellowship with some uh, folks. Uh, those refreshments are free. And uh, we know folks love to get together after service. And so you can do that uh, uh, in our fellowship hall after tonight's service. Amen. Who's ready? for tithes and offerings here tonight. Yeah, it's not the oh no part of service. It's the oh yes part of service. We're here to honor God. We're here to worship Him. And uh, just because we're not singing at this moment, that doesn't mean that the worship is stopped, right? We worship Him with our giving. And let's go right back to Malachi 3.10. Uh, we've been hanging out in the book of Malachi the last uh, few weeks. 
And Malachi 3.10 is our faithful tithing scripture. And God told Israel in a time when they were backslidden with him, they were honoring the house of God. He said, bring you all the tithes. Amen. And the answer to a tough time for our nation is to bring ourselves into the house of God, start honoring God once again. Amen. And of course, I'm preaching to the choir. You're here on a Saturday night. Amen. But we have, you know, this instruction of the Lord. He says, bring you. Notice he says to bring it, not to send it. Because God wants you here first and foremost. Amen. He says, you bring the tithes into God's house. He says that there may be meat or provision in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And you've heard me mention uh, this before. Uh, that word blessing there uh, in that verse, it isn't just you know money or finances show up, though that certainly can happen. That word blessing is actually the word benediction, or it means an idea or literally God will share with you a way out or a way to prosper, amen. He'll give you an idea, he'll show you uh, something to do that you did not think of. How many of you know blessings show up in other forms than just you know, financial, you know, God doesn't just necessarily put a check in your mailbox, right? He will show you something. He will give you something that you didn't know. He will give you guidance in leading. And I always say this, the joy with God is the knowing. Just knowing what to do is where joy comes from. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray as we bring our tithes and offerings. Father God, we just love you tonight. We praise you. Father, we thank you that as we are faithful in the tithe, you are faithful in the blessing. Father, as we take care of your house, you take care of our house. Father, we're here to honor you, to submit to you. And Lord, we know that those blessings can show up in forms of, uh, in forms of uh, leadings and ideas and direction and guidance. Father, you telling us things to do that we would have never thought of our own. Father, you could order our steps. You could bring good things into our path. Lord, all because we're faithful with the tithe. And Lord, we love you tonight. We praise you and honor you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Brothers, you may serve the people. Let's continue on now with our praise and worship. Let's stand to our feet. Let's sing to the Lord. Let's yes, lift our Lord. voices. Let's glorify Thank him you, tonight. Father. Father, we just glorify Thank you. you. Lord, we Jesus. magnify you, Lord God. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord, because you are good. Your mercy endures forever. We bless you. We bless you, Jesus. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in you. of the goodness of God.
Father, you are so faithful. Come on, everybody. If you agree with that, go ahead. Just lift your voice and praise him. Thank the Lord for his goodness. Father, you have done good things, kind things to us, for us, things that we're not even aware of at times. You are so faithful. You are so good. Father, you've kept us out of, out of harm's way. Father, you've restored us at times, and we didn't even realize it. Father, there's times when we've been ungrateful. And Father, you have still been good to us. Father, you're just so wonderful. We bless you. We glorify you. Come on, everybody. Let's just lift our hands in this place and worship the Lord. Father, you are holy. You are righteous and good. We are so grateful, Father, for your kindness and your patience. And Father, for your mercy. Father, we've come to receive your word here tonight. And Lord, we're going to rejoice at your word as those who found great spoil. Father, we thank you. Lord, we just know it's a good place to be, to be in the house of God. And we just rely upon the Holy Spirit tonight to open the verses to us. Father, I pray that I speak as the oracles of God. I minister by the ability that you've placed in me, that Father, that you would receive all the praise and all the glory. Father, you are faithful. You are good. Your word is life to those that find it, health to all of our flesh. Father, we thank you. Your word will never pass away. We thank you, Lord. We're going to receive your life, your health here tonight. And Lord, we just give you all the praise, all the glory in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. I'll tell you what, I love singing that song. You know, God is so good. He's faithful. Even when, you know, things have gotten tough, even when things don't seem to be going right at times. Isn't God good to us? Amen. I'll tell you what, are you here tonight? Has God been good to us? Amen. Yes, he has. Are you ready for God's word? Yeah, I tell you what, you know, I had to miss uh, last week, and, and uh, I'll tell you, when I go without a week, I, I, I miss you. I think about it, and so I'm just so glad to be here with you. All right, turn with me in your Bibles. Go over to John chapter 8, and tonight I'm going to call this message, Overcoming the Wicked One overcoming the wicked one and tonight I'm going to be talking about spiritual warfare and biblical spiritual warfare and how to handle spiritual attack you know so many you know Christians have interesting ideas about what spiritual warfare is you know some believers uh, uh, know nothing about it have never been taught anything about it and others have been taught you know really goofy or flaky doctrine you know they've been taught to shout at the devil or you know to you know pull demons down out of the sky and stuff like that well we're gonna get a biblical look at what it means to handle spiritual attack God's way amen and to do that we've got to know a little something about our enemy how many of you know we have an adversary the Bible tells us over there in 1 Peter 5 8 it says your adversary the devil and of course Jesus talked about him and we certainly you know aren't here tonight to uh, uh, give him any credit you know uh, uh, the devil that is and and we're not here to make people devil conscious and demon conscious and think that every little thing in life is a demon behind it you know if it was negative you know there's some Christians if they stub their toe they think a demon made them do it or something like that well we don't want to make you goofy or flaky but we've got to know and understand that we're living in a season 
and in a, a, a day of spiritual attack. And we've got to know how to repel that. We've got to understand what our enemy does and, 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 and what's behind these things. Amen. And so we're going to uh, do that here tonight. Go over to John chapter 8. Is it okay if I do a little teaching here tonight? Usually we kind of have a, a home-based scripture, but tonight we're just going to start right in and we're going to be turning to lots of verses here tonight. Is that all right? Go to John chapter 8 and we're going to uh, talk about how to handle spiritual attack, how to deal with the enemy, amen, not to get you know, goofy or flaky or anything like that. But we've got to first and foremost understand that these attacks, they are from a, an enemy who coordinates these attacks. You know, spiritual attacks are not, you know, random. They're not by chance, but they are coordinated by an enemy who hates us. But I've got some good news for you here tonight. The enemy and our adversary, the devil that we have to contend with, we got to know this. He is very vulnerable and he has a lot of weaknesses. He's got a lot of weaknesses. And so I want to tell you all about those here tonight. Now, what we're going to do before we get into the main part of the message is I'm going to give you several facts about the adversary that we have to contend with. All right. And we're going to start right in the, uh, uh, John chapter 8 with the very words of Jesus. Now, this is an interesting verse to start with. When I start reading this, please know this is not Jesus speaking to you. <laughs> All right. This is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees who were trying to oppose him. And Jesus was letting them know what influence they were under. Jesus talked a lot about the devil. The devil is not a metaphor. The devil is not an allegory. The devil is a real personality. He is a fallen cherub angel, the Bible says. He is very coordinated. He hates God. He hates me and you. But the good news is we do not have to lose or suffer at his hand at all. Now, let me show you this. Go to John 8, 44. Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. I had to make sure to, you know, give that warning because if all of a sudden I just start saying to you, you are of your father, the devil, that could really take somebody off guard, right? Jesus says to them, to these Pharisees that were trying to bring him down, he says, you are of your father, the devil, meaning you are under the influence of Satan himself is what Jesus told the Pharisees, which is interesting because they were the religious leaders of the day. It can happen, right? You are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. Isn't it interesting? Now, these, these folks, they were not following God. They were certainly not born again yet or anything like that. And uh, notice you know, what Jesus revealed to them. He said, God is not your father. The devil is your father. Isn't that interesting? And, and really, that's true for everybody on this earth until they make Jesus Christ the Lord of their life. All right? At that moment, God becomes your father. All right? Now, he says, Jesus is talking about the devil. He says, he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. There was a time when the devil, his name was Lucifer, and he was a cherub angel. And there was a time, the Bible says in Ezekiel 28, it says there was a time when he abode in the truth of God. He wasn't made evil. He was once good, and he did not abide in the truth. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He says he was a murderer from the beginning. He did not stay in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he, the devil, is a liar and the father of it. All right, here's fact number one that we have to know about our enemy. Number one, he's a liar or a deceiver. He's a liar and a deceiver, all right? We've got to know and understand that that is going to be the main tactic of our adversary. He's going to lie to you, and yet he's going to try to promote it as truth. I mean, he is a liar and a deceiver. He's going to bring thoughts into your life to try to tell you how worthless you are, all right? You know, he's going to, uh, uh, you know, come to you and, and, and try to tell you that he's going to cut your life short or he's going to cut your child's life short. He's going to do this. He's a liar and a deceiver. And we've got to know that he's a liar and deceiver. 
See, a lot of Christians, they never even learn how to discern those thoughts that bombard their mind. They never learn to one time stand up and speak to those thoughts and say, no, 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 devil, you're a liar and you're a deceiver. And if you're telling me this, it must mean that the opposite is true. You know, the Bible says that we're the apple of God's eye. Amen. The devil will try to come in and tell you how depressed you are, how lowly you are. No, the Bible says in 1 Peter 3.10 that I can love life and see good days. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, he's going to try to tell you he's going to cut your life short. But the Bible says that, you know, uh, uh, with long life, God will satisfy us and show us his salvation. And so a lot of Christians, they never even know how to discern those thoughts. They think that those thoughts are just coming to them randomly. Or the enemy will come and tell you, you know what, you just be better off if you just terminate your own life right now. You know, he will give you a thought and then he will blame you for having it because he's a liar and a deceiver. He'll give you thoughts of not wanting to serve God anymore and then he'll accuse you that a good Christian would never dare think that way. We know this, the Bible speaks of seducing spirits. The Bible talks about seducing spirits that will be operational in the end days. Remember 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1? It says that the Holy Spirit speaks expressly or urgently that in the end days some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines that demons teach. Isn't that interesting? A seducing spirit is just a, a demon that lies to people. He tries to seduce them by telling them a lie. Hey, it would be better if you just, uh, you know, stop serving God. Oh, you know, you'd have more time on your hand. You'd enjoy life more. Go to the party. Go to the bar. You know, pick up, you know, some alcohol. Go get high. Go do this. Go do that. That's a seducing spirit trying to tell you that you would be happier doing something else than following God. That's a seducing spirit. You know, a seducing spirit will, will try to tell you, oh, you could leave your spouse. You'd be happier. You'd finally have the joy, you know, that you've been looking for. And maybe it would be completely, obviously, you know, uh, uh, not the plan of God. Or there would be no reason to leave your spouse outside of the devil just telling you, oh, you'd be happier. That's the kind of thing that a seducing spirit does. But Christians never learn to identify those thoughts from the enemy and to say right out of their mouth, devil, you're a liar. I bet you I say that several times every week. Every week a thought will come to my mind and I will know because I know the truth. I will know and identify that thought. It didn't come from me. It didn't come from God. It came from the enemy. And I'll say, devil, you're a liar. Devil, you're a liar. Amen. We have to know and understand he's a liar. And I'll tell you what, we will never walk in the blessings of God if we're listening to a liar. Do you see the danger of listening to those thoughts? They can absolutely crush the blessing of God in your life if you're paying attention to them. Well, amen. Notice what Jesus also said. Here's a second fact about our adversary. It says Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning. The Bible tells us that Cain murdered Abel because he was inspired by the devil himself. You know, the Bible says that Cain was of that wicked one. So the Bible tells us that Cain was inspired of the enemy to kill his brother who loved God. We know this, murderer here, yeah, it means to kill somebody, but it also means to hate somebody for loving God. So we know this, our enemy hates those that are obedient to God. He hates those that are obedient to God. All right. Oh, we've got to know this. Oh. Go with me to 1 Peter 5, 8. So we know this. He's a, a liar. He's a murderer. And now we're going to see what else that he is. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. Are you here tonight? Yeah. All right. I'm going to show you how to stand up to these spiritual attacks. Some people, they're like, I'm never under a spiritual attack. Well, then I tell you what, you're ultimately deceived. So I don't even believe the devil exists. Well, then you're really deceived. I'll tell you what, if the devil can hide from you to the point where you don't even believe he's real, well, then I'm telling you, he is dominating your life. Look at 1 Peter 5, 8. It tells us something else about the devil. 
It says this, be sober, be vigilant. That means be watchful. We all know what sobriety is. I mean, it, do you know what the Bible definition, I'll just real quick, I, I could show you this, I could study it out for you. The Bible definition of sobriety is no alcohol and no worry. Do you know that Jesus compares the worry, you know, of the cares of this life to alcohol? You know, and, and what is that? Luke chapter uh, 21, you can go over there and read it sometime. He lists it in the same kind of way that it's as something that steals your sobriety. If you're worried all the time, you're not sober. If you're intoxicated all the time, you're not sober. Well, anyway, <laughs> I'm going to help somebody here tonight before it's all over. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Now, real quickly, we'll look at verse 9, because we're going to come back to this later in the message. Go to verse 9. I just want to uh, show you what verse 9 says. Whom resist steadfast in the faith? So the Bible tells us the devil must be real, because you would not resist a metaphor. You know what I mean? You're not resisting something that doesn't exist. You're not resisting an allegory or a, a representation of something. Notice the Bible calls the devil a whom. Not a what, he's a whom. All right. So now we're going to come back to this later. Notice the Bible says, resist the devil with your faith. Resist the devil with your faith. But go back to verse 8, and I'm going to give you the third fact here about our enemy here tonight. Notice it says that he goes about as a roaring lion. The Bible didn't say he is a roaring lion. It says he tries to go about like a, a roaring lion. So here's the third thing we must know about the devil. He's a fake. He's a fake and he's a fraud. All right. He's as a roaring lion. What does that mean? He's pretending to have more ability than he really has. He's pretending to have more ability than he really has. Do you see that? Now notice what he dresses up for. Hey, since Halloween's coming up, not that I honor it or whatever, I'm not against, you know, anyway, we won't go down all the debates of Christians participating in Halloween and so on. I don't, my kids don't, but I've also seen people, they have harmless costumes on their kids and stuff. I've got whatever, whatever. That's your business, I don't care, all right? So many people, they want me to, you know, uh, comment on all that. You're going to have to follow your own heart on that, right? But it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, again, he tries to make himself appear to have more ability than he actually has. And speaking, you know, about Halloween and costumes and, and, and such, the Bible's telling us what the devil dresses up as. What, he, what costume is he wearing? He's wearing the roaring lion costume. All right. Why do you put on a costume or if somebody, you know, is working, have you ever seen those uh, theme park haunted houses and stuff, you know, and they've got people inside there and, you know, when you walk in there and, and, and there's people in there that are trying to scare you, they're not wearing jeans and a sweatshirt, right? You know, because if I was in there, you know, with my jeans and my sweatshirt on, they came around the corner and I said, hey, my name's Tim. It's not going to scare them, right? But they put on a costume, they put on something fake in order to produce fear. And so the devil puts on something that's fake in order to produce fear. Why does the devil do that? Because if you and I could see the devil for what he truly is, we would not be afraid of him. We would not be afraid if we could see. Do you know the Bible says that? Where's that verse? Isaiah 14, starting in 12, go down to try 16. Try a Isaiah 14, 16. This is talking about the devil. Is this the one? Yeah. This is talking about the day when we will see the devil for who he truly is. This is talking about Lucifer who became Satan. It says, they that will see you shall narrowly look upon you. That means we'll look at him and be like, wait, what? They said, we'll look at him and consider him. 
Not fear him, consider him. Is it saying, this is what the world will say when they finally see the devil, who he truly is, saying, is this the man that made the earth to tremble? Is this what we were afraid of the whole time? Is this, is this what made kingdoms shake? The Bible says one day God will reveal to you just how little the devil is. Just how little he is. He's a fake. He's in a costume. He's not a roaring lion. He's just trying to convince us that he's got more ability than he really has. He's got to act like a roaring lion because he can't scare anybody any other way. Do you understand that? He's a liar. He's a murderer. He is a fake. All right. And it says the world will look narrowly upon him one day and say, is this what made the earth tremble? Is this what was really the root of our worry and our panic? And we got scared about all this stuff? Oh my goodness. So you know this. He is a total fraud. He is a fake. Because if you saw him for what he really is, you wouldn't be scared. All right? Notice he has to deceive you if you're going to get afraid. He's just got to deceive you. It's no different than walking into one of those theme parks and they've got a haunted house or something like that. All right, now go with me to Hebrews chapter 2. And I'll, I'll tell you the, the, the fourth fact. He is a liar, he's a murderer, and he's a fake. We've got to know how to identify these spiritual attacks upon our life. And we need to call them that. And I don't mean you go, you know, shouting at the top of your lungs up at, you know, Wegmans or something. Don't make a, a scene or a fool out of yourself. But there's a lot of thoughts every week that are going to enter your mind that are straight coordinated from the enemy. And there's going to have to come a time when Christians actually, even if it's just under your breath, say, devil, you're a liar. Oh, the devil gave you a thought about your spouse. You're lying. You're lying. I don't believe that about my spouse. Nope, nope. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I don't believe that about my children. Nope. Uh, the devil will, will tell you a, a whole host of things. He'll say, you know, he's going to bring your life down. He's going to ruin your finances. No, no, you can't, you can't curse that which God has blessed. That's what the word says. Amen. You know, I mean, if, if we're going to look at the devil someday and say, really, is this it? Why don't we just start believing that now by faith? He, you are nothing to me. The enemy is nothing to me. Satan is nothing to me. Those, there's thoughts that enter my mind all the time that are straight from him. I know they're from him, and I simply say, you're a liar. And see, when somebody's lying, it means the opposite is true. He says he's going to take you out. You say, well, that must mean I'm going to live long. Or, you know, you say you're going to take away my finances. That means God's going to richly bless me. Amen. That's right. Praise the Lord. I don't have to worry about this bugger anymore. Where did I tell you to go? Hebrews chapter 2. So, well, Pastor, what are you talking about? Talking about the devil and all this stuff. I don't know. Well, you better know. So, well, most churches wouldn't teach us this. They're almost embarrassed to admit that they believe the devil is real. <laughs> well, if they're embarrassed of God's word, that's their problem. That's their problem. I'm not saying that all of them are. Go to, go to Hebrews 2 and verse 14. Here's the fourth fact that we must know about our enemy. Not only is he a liar... He's a murderer. He just hates us because we do right. He hates when you do right. So I love to make him mad, right? People say, oh, I'm scared. The devil's going to do something to me. If you believe that, then he can do something to you. All right. He's a fake. He's a fraud. He's acting like a lion. He's not one. We know who the true lion is. The lion of Judah, Jesus Christ. He's just a fake for Jesus. He's always just tried to uh, mimic what God was really doing. All right, look at Hebrews 2.14. It says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. It's talking about the children of God. Do we have any children of God here tonight? Do you have your flesh and blood with you? Yep, we're in our natural body. It says, He, speaking of Jesus, Jesus also himself likewise took part of the same. See, in those days there was a lot of people that believed that Jesus came in spirit only. They did not believe that, you know, Jesus came in a, a, a bodily form. They were called the Gnostics, all right? And they, they challenged this idea that Jesus actually came in the flesh. Well, of course he did. And so the Bible is just dealing with that. It says, Jesus likewise took part of a human body that through death, of course, on the cross, Jesus would destroy him that had the power of death, that is, 
the devil. When Jesus died on that cross and when he rose again, the Bible says that he did something to the devil that day. He destroyed him. He destroyed him. Oh my goodness, isn't that interesting? So now he's not only, he's a, a, a liar, he's a murderer, he's a fake and a fraud, he's now destroyed. He's destroyed. Do you know that? Do you know that the enemy is destroyed? He wasn't, he's not destroyed someday in the future. He was destroyed 2,000 years ago. And see, that's the biggest lie that he's trying to tell Christians today. He's trying to tell Christians that he's not destroyed, but he is destroyed. Let me show you, uh, uh, of course, go on to verse 15. I just love to read verse 15. It says, and deliver us, it's talking about us, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Jesus destroyed the one that produced fear in our lives. He says, you don't have to be afraid of dying. Right? Remember over there, what is that? Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18. Remember Jesus said, I am the one. I have the keys to death and hell. Hell and death. He says, I, ha I took the keys away from the, the enemy. Yeah, is that? Mm, yeah, there it is. I am he that lives and was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. Where did Jesus get those keys? He descended into that place and he took those keys away from the enemy. Amen. Right? That's why the Bible says, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, grave, where, or death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Amen. The devil's got no hold on us for fear and, and, and so on and so forth. Go to Colossians. You can just go right here. Let me show you a verse. Colossians 2.15. Maybe you've never studied out the, this passage. Uh, praise the Lord. And I feel the bass. Ooh. That's, that is not a car out at that stoplight out there. That is the power of God shaking the foundation of the building. So you can say, it's just like Acts chapter 4. The foundation shook. <laughs> praise the Lord. Look at this. All right. Okay, okay, okay. Go back up to verse 14. I wasn't going to start there, but I want to fill you in. Okay, do you know that the Bible tells us in the New Testament that before Jesus died on that cross for us, there was a whole list of everything that we were guilty of. And that list, let's just say this, it's endless. All of us. All of us. We had a handwriting, uh, the law of God was against us. We were guilty, 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 guilty. We deserved to die. And we all deserved to go to hell. But the good news is Jesus came for us. And it says this, Jesus on the cross was blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that were against us. Every guilty thing on our charges, he was blotting it out which was contrary to, to us, Jesus took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Isn't that awesome? Every bit of guilt and shame for all of us was nailed to that cross. Aren't you glad? What else was Jesus doing on that cross? The King James kind of leaves it a little ambiguous. Go to verse 15. Look what it says in verse 15. And Jesus having spoiled principalities and powers... Jesus made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in the cross. All right, aren't you glad? The principalities and powers is talking about Satan and all demonic personalities. Can you bring this up in the Amplified for us? I know I'm, we're going to a lot of scriptures here tonight. I haven't even started my real message yet. <laughs> God disarmed. The principalities and powers, that's the devil and all demons. He disarmed them that were ranged against us, and God made a bold display and public example of them and triumphing over them in Christ and in the cross. So who is the devil? He's destroyed. He is a defeated foe. God has already taken him out for us. Do you realize that? Amen. So that's the fourth fact here that we're going, not only is he a liar, a murderer, a fake, but he's also destroyed. So you got to know this. You got to know this. You got to know this. All right. Now, let me show you how to specifically overcome the wicked one, the Bible calls him. 
Go to James chapter 4. Go to James chapter 4. You get anything out of this here tonight? Oh, a lot of Christians, they do not know how to actually stand in spiritual warfare. They think if they just shout loud enough, if they just, you know, cry out loud enough. No, that's not spiritual warfare necessarily. There's something that you got to do. Go to James chapter 4. Praise the Lord. I'm getting to it. There it is. Go to verse 7. Here we go. Here's what we do. Now, you can bring it up in the King James. That's fine, too. Amplified works. Yeah, that, we'll just read it right there. That'll be fine. The Bible says, so be subject to God. Or literally, the King James says, submit yourself, therefore, to God. Or literally, surrender your life to him. All right? What does surrendering your life God, uh, to God do? It gets you on God's turf. It gets you in a place where God can reach you. And the Bible says, submit yourself to God, but do what? Resist the devil. Doesn't say resist the metaphor. Don't resist the allegory. Resist the devil. Stand firm against him. And what will the devil do? The devil will flee from you. It didn't say that the devil was going to flee from Jesus or flee from the Father. He's going to run from you. All right, so now this verse, here we go. We are learning what the devil hates the most. Or you could say it this way, what the devil fears the most. Right, you see it in this verse? He fears a believer who knows how to resist him. Because he knows that if a believer will resist him biblically, he will have no choice but to run away. He will flee. All right. So notice this. Notice whose job it is to resist the devil. It's our job. God's not going to do it for you. Jesus is not going to do it for you. The Holy Spirit isn't going to do it for you. Of course, they empower you. you know, the, the Lord empowers us. But he's not going to, you can't ask God to do something about the devil. He already did. He destroyed him 2,000 years ago. He destroyed him 2,000 years ago. Now, the devil still exists. But he, what it means when it says he destroyed, it means he took away his power. He took away his power. All right. So, number one way. Are you ready? Here's how to overcome the wicked one or spiritual attacks. Number one, now that I'm going to explain this. I know this is going to sound all fancy at first, but just bear with me. Persistence versus resistance. Persistence versus resistance all right so what does the devil fear the most he fears you knowing how to resist him all right so now you will have to learn how to re resist here's the mistake that believers make when dealing with spiritual attacks they assume the devil has power they assume the devil has power he cannot keep you under any kind of power of his. Do you understand that? The devil does not have power. He has persistence. See, when he lost his power, he had to go find a power substitute, which is just persistence. He's just going to try over and over and over and over again and try to make you feel like that's his power keeping you under the, these things. All right. And sometimes we feel like these spiritual attacks are getting worse. But really, they're not so much getting worse as much as the devil is just staying very persistent. Do you understand that? He is the devil of persistence. But we are believers of resistance. Here's what you got to know. You can resist him longer than he can persist. Do you know that? The Bible says that we've been given the fruit of the Spirit. Can you real quickly just bring up Galatians 5.22 for us? I wasn't planning on going here. I wasn't planning on saying this. But think about it. The devil, he's real persistent. He will just stay at something, stay at something, stay at something. Why? He's testing your ability to resist. He's testing your ability to resist. But look what we have. Because we have the fruit of the Spirit. This is what God put in you when you got born again. Are you ready? But the fruit of the Spirit is love. That means we can love like God loves. 
That means we know how to be nice. <laughs> joy. Joy is not uh, uh, just a feeling. Joy is a choice. Joy is the result of living from the inside out. If you live out here in this world and, and that's all you look at, I'm telling you, you won't have any joy. Because there's not much to be joyful of out there, but there's everything to be joyful of in here. Peace. Peace is the fruit of the Spirit. God has put that on the inside of us. But I love how the, the King James words this. He also gave us what? Long-suffering. Long that does not sound fun. That does not sound like fruit. That sounds like bad fruit. But that's the word for extreme patience. Or literally, you could say it this way, supernatural endurance. You've got the fruit of the Holy Ghost. You've got supernatural endurance, and the devil does not. The devil doesn't have the fruit of the Spirit. He cannot endure as long as you can. That, how do you know? Because he's got to run from you. There will come a time when his persistence runs out and says, they are outlasting me. Their resistance is lasting longer than my persistence. And he says, finally, I've got to leave and go away. Do you see this? Okay. All right. Believers make the mistake by assuming that the devil has power. But he doesn't. It's no longer an issue of power. It's now an issue of persistence. Do you understand this? This is the lie of the enemy. That is to convince us that his persistence is actually power. There's no power in it. All right. Like I said, it can feel like things are getting worse. It's not because the devil's getting stronger. He's just keeping up with his persistence. All right. We have to know this, that our, our resistance will shorten his persistence. You know what I mean? Oh, this is how the devil operates. He's looking for believers who don't know how to resist. That's what he does. He's, he's going around acting like a lion, see who will actually believe the costume. You know, people that will actually get scared. You know, actually worry in this life. And so what he does, he, goes, he stays very persistent trying to make you think that it's power. Oh, go to Luke 4. Go to Luke chapter 4. Do you know Jesus did this? Go to Luke chapter 4. Yep, I'm going to have you turn right there. Jesus did this. I've got supernatural endurance. I can run longer than the devil can run. I can resist him longer than he can persist against me. If you know how to resist, you will get to the end of his rope. You will get to the end of his persistence. You will get to the end of his lies. You will get, you know, uh, uh, to the end of his fraud. You will get to the end of it. You'll get to the end of that pressure, that spiritual attack, that depression. You'll get to the end of it. You'll get to the end of that discouragement. You'll get to the end of those feelings where you feel worthless and helpless and hopeless and all that stuff. The devil's a liar. He's going to tell you how hopeless it is. He'll try to tell you that your depression is the new normal. It's not the new normal. I'll tell you what, I, like we already said, we've got the joy of the Lord. We've got the fruit of the Spirit. Listen, it's not my fault. The devil is a very miserable individual. You think, uh, you think you've seen someone depressed? You've never seen anybody as depressed as the devil is. There's nobody more sad and driven by discouragement than the devil himself. He knows what is written of him in the back of the book. He knows he's a loser. He knows he's, he's done. You say, well, Pastor, you just talk so you know, fervently about you know, the reality of the devil. You better. You better. You better understand a little something about how the, the, the spiritual realm works. Where did I tell you we were going? Go to Luke chapter 4. And I'll just real quickly, we'll just look at these verses. Look what Jesus said when he was dealing with the devil. Remember this in Luke chapter 4? And start in verse 4. Remember the devil was tempting him, trying him, trying to get him to disobey God. Jesus answered him, answered the devil. Jesus had an answer for the devil, do you? When the devil puts a thought in your mind that is not from God and it's not from yourself, do you have an answer? Here's the mistake that Christians make. They do not answer him. What was Jesus doing? Resisting. He said, I know I can, I can resist longer than he can persist. I will just get to the end of it. 
Jesus had an answer, said, no, it's written in God's word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from, that proceeds from the mouth of God. Go down to verse 8. So the devil then tries another temptation on him. Jesus answered him again. As long as the devil kept persisting, Jesus had another answer. And notice he's just quoting scripture. He's quoting scripture. He knew what the scripture said. Jesus answered and said unto him, get behind me, Satan. Doesn't that sound a lot like what we were talking about a few moments ago? Satan, you're a liar. Satan, you're a fraud. Satan, you're a fake. It's not like you've got to talk to the devil all day. Don't misunderstand me. Please don't get weird and flaky. You know, don't be going around home like, that pastor taught me down there how to talk to the devil. <laughs> you know, but you understand? We're talking about resisting. He says, get behind me, Satan. What was Jesus doing? Resisting. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Go down to verse 12. Jesus does it again. Jesus answering said to the devil again. He just kept on answering that. How many times you got to answer that thought in your mind? It could be a thought of suicide. It could be a temptation with pornography. It could be a thought of greed or, or adultery or whatever it could be. It could be depression. It could be anxiety. How long do you answer it? As long as it keeps persisting, you keep answering until that it can't persist any longer. This is what Christians fail to know. What was Jesus doing? He was in the midst of spiritual warfare. He was taking the devil head on with these temptations. He just kept saying, nope, I know the word. Nope, I know the word. As the devil kept giving him thoughts and temptations, he just kept on answering it. He said to him, nope, thou shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now, what's really interesting, go to verse 13. What happens after he just kept on answering? And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Sounds like he fleed from, he was fleeing from Jesus. He was fleeing. Because that's what happens when you resist the enemy, he's going to have to flee. Jesus just, per, uh, he resisted until the devil could no longer persist. And it says that the devil departed. Jesus had supernatural patience. Supernatural long-suffering. Didn't feel good what Jesus was going through, right? Didn't feel good to get tempted like that. Doesn't feel good to go through depression. Doesn't feel good to have suicidal thoughts, right? But we persist, all right? We resist until he can no longer persist. Jesus just outlasted him. Bring this up in the Amplified. I love it in the Amplified. If you've ever never studied out this verse, look what it says in the Amplified. I love this verse in the Amplified. And when the devil had ended every, the complete cycle of temptation. Isn't that awesome? It tells you how limited the devil is. He's only got so many bullets in the gun, so to speak. You know what I mean? He's only got so many rounds he can fire. The devil ended. He got... He got the devil is not omniscient. He's, omni he's, he's not omnipotent. He runs out of ideas. Isn't that awesome? The, our God never runs out of ideas. But the devil runs out of ideas. He got to the end of the complete cycle of temptation. And so he temporarily left Jesus. That is, he stood off from him until another more opportune and favorable time. Think about this. The devil's like, this was not a good time. The devil's like, I had no opportunity. This was not in my favor. I've got to leave, and hopefully I'll see another open opportunity at some point. Notice who decided whether it was a favorable environment for the devil to operate. Jesus decided that. He didn't call on God to get rid of the devil. Jesus just knew, I'm going to take away his opportunity and any favorableness to operate. It's kind of like a storm. You know, how many of you know that tornadoes cannot just pop out of nowhere? They've got to have favorable conditions, right? They've got to have humidity and, and convection and cold and warm air colliding. And, you know, yeah, I'm a meteorologist. You probably never knew that before. You're going to see me on the news, you know, pointing out the weather and all that stuff. Well, in the same way, the devil has to find a favorable atmosphere. And when he sees you, Resisting, resisting, resisting. He says, this is not an opportune time. 
This is not favorable conditions that I can operate in. Notice Jesus decided that. In the same way, you are going to decide whether or not it's a favorable atmosphere for the devil to work in your life or not. You decide if the atmosphere is good for him or not. He'll say, well, God, where are you? Lord, make it so the devil can't operate around me. God's going to tell you it's not his job. Jesus did not turn to the Father and ask for help. He just kept on saying, it's written, it's written, it's written. And he just, he had an answer for every thought and temptation that the devil brought to him. And the devil said, well, I'm out of ideas. I can't operate here. I got to go stand far away and wait for a better time. See what the devil's doing? See how he operates? Persistence versus resistance. Resist him until he gets to the full end of that cycle. He's got no other ideas. Supernatural endurance. Amen. Every thought that comes against you. Praise the Lord. Yes. The resistance ended the devil's persistence. Yeah. Like I said, the resistance made it inopportune for the devil. So this tells us more about the devil, right? He's a scavenger. He wants easy prey. Right? Right? He cannot hold up to our resistance. He is looking for those who will put up the least resistance. And this is what happens with spiritual warfare. We've got a lot of modern day Christians who put up zero resistance to him. Put up very little. All right. Now, let me show you this again. Go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Are you getting something out of this? Here we go. Go to Matthew 12, 43. Remember when Jesus talked about this? About the demonic realm? About spiritual pressure, spiritual attack? Go to Matthew 12 and verse 43. Watch this. Look at what Jesus... This, these are the words of Jesus. Jesus says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man... Notice, somebody can have an unclean spirit. That's not a godly spirit. That's an ungodly spirit. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a person, he, the spirit, walks through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. So Jesus obviously is telling us that demons are real. They are real. We don't have to be scared of them. And that's obviously the point of the message tonight. Verse 44, Jesus says, Then he says, saith, he, the, the demonic spirit, the unclean spirit says... I will return into my house from where I came out. And when he has come, now the unclean spirit finds his previous home, that, that person that he left at one point, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, this unclean spirit, and he takes with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. They enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. He says, even so shall it be also with this wicked generation. He said, this wicked generation, they will get delivered of an unclean spirit. But when that spirit comes back, that spirit finds, go back up to verse 44, they find it what? Empty, swept, and garnished. What does that mean? The spirit that leaves a person, that demonic spirit that could have gotten out of somebody's life goes and looks for you know, rest and finds none and comes back and he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. What does that mean? He found no resistance. It was, just, it was an empty house. There was nothing guarding it, nothing in it. No one gave it any value or importance. And the, and the devil showed back up and said, oh yeah, I left him alone for a while. And I'm going to come back and look. I found no resistance. And he says, he says to his other more, notice there's spirits more wicked than others. Yeah. Did you see that in verse 45? Yeah. Jesus says, then that unclean spirit tells seven more spirits more wicked than himself. Boy, don't get me going on that subject. The Bible talks about uh, spirits that are more wicked than others. That's an interesting study for a different day. He takes with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. He says, even so it will be to this wicked generation. They will get delivered from God, but they will not resist when the, the, the unclean spirit of their past comes back. Folks, we've got to know and understand this. 
if you've had trouble in areas before, and even though you've gotten free from those things, those things will try to show back up at your door. But see, when they show back up, you need to be prepared to resist. Resist. And I'm going to demonstrate what resisting is and what it looks like and so on. All right. But I just wanted you to see there. Now, remember, can you remember when we looked at 1 Peter 5, 9 at the beginning? You can bring that up just on the screen. Remember how verse 8 was talking about our adversary, you know, be sober, be vigilant for our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion goeth about seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9, whom resist steadfast in the faith. All right, so now we're starting to get more specific about how to resist. When that unclean spirit came back to that man, he found no faith confession to resist. We resist Satan with faith. With faith. Remember, faith is when we believe, therefore we speak. What is that verse? The spirit of faith. 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 4.13? Is it 1 Corinthians 4.13? 2 Corinthians 4.13, Reverend Tony says. So if, he, if he's wrong... Oh, no, I think, no, no, verse 13. No, 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 I think you're right, verse 14. Go to 1 Corinthians 4, 14. Which one is it? It's in there. Try 1 Corinthians 4, 14. No, no, no. Where is that? Someone to help me with that verse. Is it 13, 4? <laughs> we having believed, therefore we having the same spirit of faith. We have believed, therefore we speak. Where is that verse? I hear it in my, my heart. I hear the verse, but the chapter and verse is escaping me at the moment. Someone find that verse. All right, I will. All right, Google. I don't know. Praise the Lord. I want to, I, I want to find that verse. 413. Oh, we were one verse away. Go back up. 2 Corinthians 413. So Reverend Tony was right. He got it. There we go. See, never question that man of God over there, right there. 2 Corinthians 4.13. We were right there. We were right in the neighborhood. 2 Corinthians. He's working on it. Let his fingers do the walking back there. We, see, we were right there, weren't we? We having the same spirit of faith. Do you have the spirit of faith? Well, the Bible tells us. Do you know that word spirit there? It actually means the vitality or the vital signs of faith. How do you tell when somebody is alive? You check their vital signs. How do you know when your faith is alive? You check its vital signs. We having the vital signs of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore I have spoken. We also believe and therefore we speak. Your faith is not alive until it speaks. See, this is what the Bible's talking about. This is how we resist the devil in our faith. We speak. We speak. Amen. What did Jesus do? He spoke. He spoke the word of God. He said, nope, devil, you're a liar. It is written. Nope, get behind me, Satan. It is written. Nope, that's not true. It is written. Jesus didn't just think those things. He spoke those things. What was he doing? Resisting with the spirit of faith. Oh, amen. Now, we're going to end right here. And so now I'm starting to demonstrate what this resistance looks like. Let me show you literally how this happens. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Go to Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm going to demonstrate this some more here in just a moment. Go to Ephesians. Have you ever looked at the arsenal of the devil? Have you ever looked at the weapon? The Bible describes one weapon that the devil has. I mean literally a weapon. I'm not talking about just fear and, and that. Do you know what the weapon of the devil is? When he comes to a fight, do you know what he brings? Let me show you. Let me show you this. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Praise the Lord. Oh, man, this weapon is really something. Oh, boy. I'm getting sarcastic now. Oh boy, go to Ephesians, you're in 6.6. 6. No, go down to verse 16. Let's make it short. Go to Ephesians 6.16. Watch this. 
telling us about the weapons of our warfare, t talking about what we have on our side, this is talking about us. Above all, we take the shield of faith. Isn't that what we were just talking? The shield of faith is what? The spirit of faith. I've believed, therefore I speak. The devil will put a thought in my mind saying, you're going to die young. And I say, no, Psalm 91, 16 says, with long life he satisfies me and shows me his salvation. No, uh, Exodus 23, 26 says, the Lord will give me the full number of my days. Amen. Praise the Lord. How many of you know long life is a blessing from God? All right. So that's a, when I say that, you know, uh, when the devil tries to tell me something about my kids, I, I, I quote Psalm 112. I said, no, my kids are mighty seed upon the earth. They're the generation of the upright and they're blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in their house and their righteousness shall endure forever. That's what the word says. When I get that thought that comes in and bombards my mind, instantly I start to speak. I don't just think, well, no. I don't just think up in my mind silently. No, the Bible says something different. I'll say it. I won't necessarily scream it off, you know, from the rooftop. I might be just under my breath. It might be while I'm driving. I might be sitting in my office. My wife might be there with me. You know, and it's always fun, you know, when she all of a sudden hears me to start, you know, casting down thoughts or something. But she knows and understands. You know, I'll say, no, no. You know, and I'll speak that verse. No, with long life you satisfy me. No. My children are mighty seed upon the earth. They're the generation of the upright, and they're blessed. Amen. The Bible says that they will, uh, they're like uh, arrows in the hand of a mighty warrior, and they're going to tear down the enemy's gate. Right? Psalm 127. You know, praise the Lord. All your children are taught of the Lord. Amen. The Bible says. And so what is that? That is me resisting. Even if I'm just whispering it, guess what? What it is? It's me whispering. One whispered word of faith has more power than anything the devil could ever shout. One word of whispered faith has more power than anything the devil could shout. See, that's why Christians, when they're shouting at the devil, they don't believe. Shouting at the devil is not an act of faith. It's an act of disbelief. If you've ever been familiar with these places that teach that, ah, blah, 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 they, they, they believe that the louder you get with the devil, then he's got to obey. No, no, no. If you believe the word, God doesn't do that. God told, you know, Elijah, he said, Elisha, he said, no, I wasn't in the, the earthquake. No, I wasn't in the fire. He said, but I speak to you with a still, small voice. Why? Because God said, I whisper to you, Elijah, because that means we're close. You, you know, you can, if you're whispering to somebody, you've got to be close to them, right? In the same way, I believe God's word, I don't have, it's not volume that makes it powerful. It's belief that makes it powerful. Do you understand that? And so if I just simply say, no, no, that's a lie with long life. No, I don't take that thought saying, no, I'm not going to, Lord, but my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I lack no good thing. No, he's given me the power. Uh, to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant with me as he did with my forefathers. Amen. Amen. What is that? You don't have to be animated about it. You just have to believe it. Taking the shield of faith. Now, oh, so you've got the shield of faith. Wherewith you shall be able to quench this huge, powerful uh, uh, arsenal to quench all the nuclear missiles of the wicked one. No, not, not nuclear missiles. Not even cruise missiles. Fiery darts. Fiery darts. The devil is like, I've got darts. And I'm going to sharpen my darts. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to light them on fire if I have to. And I'm going to throw darts at you. How many darts would you have to really get hit by before it would kill you? A thousand? Maybe, I mean, maybe you could get hit with 10,000 of them and it wouldn't even kill you. See this big, powerful thing? But remember, he's, he's still talking about what we have versus what he, he has. Look at verse 17. He says, you've got a shield of faith. He's got darts that are on fire. He, he says, take the helmet of salvation and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So God looks at you and he sees you with a shield 
And when the devil comes and says, I've got, I've got a sharp dart. Oh, not only that, I'm going to light it on fire. You're sitting there the whole time. Oh, yeah? Shwink! You ever heard a sword coming out of the... <laughs> Shwink! Do you see how stupid this enemy is of ours? He brings a dart to a sword fight. God is showing you, he's like, you've got armor on your head. You've got a shield. You've got a sword. And he's just got this little dart that he's trying to light on fire. But a lot of Christians, they sit there and they get hit dart after dart after dart until their life becomes a, 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 you know, a flame and fire. You know what I mean? Just a hot mess in life. You know, because they just sat there. Their shield was on their side the whole time. Their, their, their sword was there the whole time. And somebody's just sitting there attacking them with darts. When will the body of Christ take that shield, put it out in front of them, pull that sword? Because that's a picture of a Roman. That's a picture of a Roman soldier. And those Roman soldiers, when those shields came up and those swords came out, they were the ones advancing. And somebody else was fleeing. There's got to come a time where the body of Christ is going to start resisting and say, no, in Jesus' name, I am the heel of the Lord. Devil, you're a liar. Devil, you're a fake and a fraud. You know, that's not true because it is written in the word that, uh, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, I forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. Glory to God. No, I will fulfill the full number of my days. Hallelujah. What is that? Get that shield up. And stop being so concerned about an enemy who has darts when you've got a sword. Yes. Amen. He says, you've got a helmet, you've got a shield, you've got a sword. And then earlier he says, you've got protection on your feet. And you've got this, this, this guard upon your, 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 your legs and all this stuff. And then your, your little enemy. See, the Bible is constantly trying to show us what we look like in the spirit versus what the enemy looks like. You know? Is this the one that I should be scared of? He's got these darts. He can light them on fire all he wants. You know what I mean? If the, en if, if the enemy, oh, if he would hear the spirit of faith coming from his people, we would, I'll tell you what, we would resist until we are at the end of every cycle of temptation. Hey, Amen. Are you getting something out of this? Now we'll end here. I'll show you what those fiery darts are. Go to 2 Corinthians 10. Here's where spiritual warfare takes place. I've been talking about it all night, but I just want to show you the scripture. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll start in verse 3. Hallelujah! They will narrowly, narrowly look upon that old devil, and they'll say, is this the one that we were afraid of? Is this is what scared us so bad? This liar, this deceiver, this fake, this fraud, this murderer... This defeated foe, this one that really has no power, he just has persistence and lies. Come on now, this is how you handle spiritual attack. Now here's specifically what it looks like and what it says in the Word. 2 Corinthians 10.3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not, what? War after the flesh. See, that sounds a lot like what Paul told the Ephesians in uh, Ephesians 6.12. He says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So we don't, you know, people are not our problem. There is actually a real demonic realm that opposes us. And now he says, we don't walk in the flesh, or we, we walk in the flesh, or we live in the flesh, but we're not warring after the flesh. All right, so now we see that word war. Oh, boy. A lot of Christians, they take that verse, they're like, yeah. <laughs> there used to be people on TV that were uh, spiritual warfare experts, and they were dressing in fatigues and camouflage and making fools out of themselves, you know, thinking that, yeah, uh, the devil does not really care what camouflage you're wearing, all right? He just, he does not like the word of faith coming out of your mouth. Verse 4, though, and it tells us, though, Look at this. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or natural, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Everyone say strongholds. strongholds. See, that's where a lot of Christians stop. They stop right there. They say, see, there are strongholds. There's demons in the air, and we've got to pull them down. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. It's unfortunate that a lot of times it's the Pentecostals believe in that. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's, un it's totally unscriptural. Notice the little semicolon 
there at the end of that verse, that means he's not done telling us what strongholds are. Verse 5, how do you pull down strongholds? Casting down imaginations. Where do imaginations take place? In your brain. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Oh, there should be some knowledge there. Wherever imaginations are taking place, there should be some knowledge of God there too. And bringing into captivity every what? Thought to the obedience of Christ. Where do thoughts take place? In your mind. Where do imaginations take place? In your mind. Where do strongholds take place? In your mind. In your mind. Folks, the devil cannot get into your spirit. He is not going to get into your spirit. He cannot rule your spirit. But you know that even when you got saved, your mind did not get born again. The devil comes after the thought life. What does he do? He shoots fiery darts into your life. He has no real power, so he just has the power of suggestion. He can only... You ever have thoughts zing through your mind? Like, good Lord, where'd that come from? You ever had a, an imagination? Oh, don't tell me you haven't. An imagination is just an animated thought. An imagination is just a thought that also has a picture with it. You ever had pictures shoot through your mind? You're thinking, oh my Lord. All of a sudden, I mean, the devil will shoot a fiery dart through your mind. You'll see yourself dead. Or you'll see a loved one dead. He'll, he'll shoot a, 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 a thought through your mind and you'll see yourself with a, a, you know, leaving your spouse and with another person. He'll shoot a, a, a thought through you, uh, your mind. He'll show you what cheating on your taxes look like. <laughs> right, I thought, thank you, I appreciate that. I, I thought that was kind of good myself, you know. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm joking, you know. He'll show you, you know, uh, what getting drunk looks like. You know, I mean, my goodness, that was my old life. I never went back uh, to it. My last drink was January the 18th of 2003. But you know, every so often, the devil will shoot a picture through my mind of me sitting at the bar getting drunk. I say, no, that was the old life. And I said, have you not forgotten? It is written, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Stop talking to the new creation about the old one. All things are new, old things have passed away. Devil, stop telling me, stop reminding me of what my old dead self looked like. Amen. Hey, I mean, what would that do for so many people? They are so caught up in their past and the troubles. What if you said, devil, you're a liar. I'm a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. I'm not even that person anymore. I don't think that way. I don't do those things anymore. Sorry, devil, you're at the wrong address. You must be thinking about somebody else. See, spiritual warfare. See, the Bible tells us if we give heed to the wrong thought, if we start giving heed to the wrong imagination, they will become strongholds in, their, in our life. A thought is the first step. You get a thought that comes through your mind. Let's take, uh, like, you know, cheating on your spouse, for example. The devil will shoot a, a, you know, a thought through your mind, you know, just giving you a thought of what that would be like. And then he'll shoot an imagination through your mind. But if you sit there and you dwell on that and you say, okay, well, uh, what would that be like? How would I carry that out? Who would that be with? And you start to allow it to dominate your thoughts. Then when you act out that pattern of thought, you've now entered into a stronghold. A stronghold is a pattern of thinking that is against God. See? Casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Do you see this war that's taking place in your mind every day? It is you casting those thoughts down. It's like a nonstop king of the hill battle in there. You cast those imaginations down. And then, you know, anything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God, you cast it down. And then something else tries to come in and take its place. You cast it down again. Do you see what spiritual warfare is? It is not a matter of how loud you can get with the devil or how many demons you can pull down from the skies. That is nonsense. Actually, when people do that, they will give themselves more to the enemy. What spiritual warfare is, is keeping those imaginations and those thoughts in here, keep them down. 
The devil will say, you should be mad at your wife. Look what she did. Or you should be mad at your husband. He's ignoring you. Cast it down. No, I, no, I walk in forgiveness. No, I won't take that thought. Oh, no, no, no. You, 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 you should be scared. Uh, you aren't going to have enough money uh, for the mortgage payment. No, but my God shall supply all my needs. See how this is constant, like, you know, it's like, you know, God, you know, all of a sudden something comes and takes over the knowledge of God. You bring it down. Something else comes and tries to take over. See, winning in the thought life, this is what spiritual warfare is. See, a lot of Christians, they never learn this kind of resistance. Every day of my life, I would never be able to pastor these churches if I did not know this. I mean, the thoughts that bombard me on a daily basis. Nope. I don't take that thought. The devil has shown me things He's like, you could be doing this. Do you know when he showed uh, 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 Jesus the, the uh, wealth and riches of the world? I mean, the devil has shown me things that I could do in the business realm. You could do this. You'd have way, way more money. Oh, look at where you could live. Look at what you could be. Look at the things you could have. Look at what you could go do. Nope. You know, not going to do it. Sorry, devil. No, I'm going to fulfill and finish my course, run my race that God has for me. See, every day of my life, casting down thoughts and imaginations. It could be temptations to, to sin. It could be temptations with substances. It could be temptations with pornography. It could be temptations uh, uh, of saying something hurtful to your spouse or sitting there having a fight with somebody and they don't know about it. You know what I mean? You ever had a fight with somebody in your mind? You know, raging and losing your temper and all that stuff? Cast down those thoughts. Cast down those imaginations before the stronghold takes root. See, the devil says, he says, I know they've got a shield. They've got a sword. They've got a helmet. Right? Uh, they've got all this stuff. He's like, but what I'm just going to do is I'm just trying to get some darts in there. Just, you know, get those thoughts brewing in their mind. See, do you see this battle? Think, look at all the stuff going on in your brain. The Bible says, imaginations. These are talking about casting down, casting down imaginations, so there must be bad imaginations. But there's also sometimes good imaginations. Right? The Bible says to set our mind on things above. I can set my mind on the throne room of God. That's a good imagination. Imagination is an evil. There's a good side to it. So there's bad imaginations. There's good imaginations. There's high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. But there's also the knowledge of God in there. Do you see this battle going on in your mind? If you don't win it, all right, that's when the devil takes you out. That's when that dart, the only reason it's on fire, the dart itself can't kill you. It's the fire that does. Do you know what I mean? Because it starts as a little fire, and then it grows, and it grows, and it grows. And all of a sudden, those decisions burn down your life. You see, because you don't know how to cast imaginations down. The, folks, I'm telling you, we are living in the days of incredibly heightened spiritual attack. And that attack is always first and foremost in the mind. Yeah, there's circumstances taking place in your life that are tough. But what they're weighing upon is your mind. That financial attack on your life is just a leveraging bar, trying to leverage your mind into thinking the wrong thing. A physical attack on your body, trying to leverage your mind to think the wrong way, you know. A financial attack, a marital problem, uh, uh, problems at work, whatever it is, it's just leverage on your mind trying to get you to think the wrong way. Folks, this is how you resist. Speak. Speak. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 31, he said, take no thought saying, if there's a time when I have to say, I just don't take that thought. That's not my thought. I won't take it. Amen? Resist. Did you get something out of this here tonight? Amen. This is spiritual warfare. This is how you win it. Praise the Lord. Don't be, you know, overtaken by these spiritual attacks that are taking place in this day and this hour. Let's go ahead. Let's pray. Father God, we just love you and praise you. Lord, we thank you for the word of God here tonight. Lord, we know that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Father, we thank you that words of faith pull down those strongholds pull down those wrong imaginations and thoughts. Father, we know that the shield of faith will quench the fiery darts. 
Father, we know that we have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Father, we know the enemy, the only thing he's got are those little fiery darts. He doesn't have an arsenal. He doesn't have some big, mighty weapon. But if we don't block those darts, if we don't take the time to cast them down, that little fire could try to burn down our lives. Father, it matters that we resist. It matters that we know how to resist. It matters that we know how to submit ourselves to you and resist the devil and he will flee. Father, we know that you're not going to resist the devil for us. You already destroyed him 2,000 years ago, stripped him of his power. So, Father, we're going to learn this. We're going to be doers of it. Father, I pray for everyone within the sound of my voice that, Lord, that they would learn how to daily cast down thoughts and imaginations. That they would daily know how to renew their minds with the word. That, Father, that they would learn how to speak Speak that spirit of faith when the enemy knocks on their door, tries to lie to them, tries to act like a roaring lion to them. He's trying to make his abilities seem bigger than they are. He has no power. He only has persistence. But Father, what we have is resistance, and we can endure far longer than he can. Father, we just give you praise tonight. We give you glory. With all heads bowed, all eyes closed, before we dismiss, just ask yourself this question in your heart. Have I made Jesus Christ the Lord of my life? Have I done what Romans 10, 9 says to do? Which it says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Ask yourself that question. Am I saved? Have I personally invited Jesus into my heart? If you don't know, or if the answer is no, then don't leave here until you know that you have God's salvation. Eyes are closed, heads are bowed. I'm not gonna make you stand up. I'm not gonna make you come down front. But if you're here tonight and you say, Pastor, I need to know that I'm saved. I need to know that if I were to pass off this earth, that I would be in the presence of God, that I'd be saved by his love and his kindness. Folks, I'm going to tell you the truth. There is a hell. But the good news is there's a heaven. And God didn't make hell for you. He made heaven for you. But we've got to receive Jesus by faith. It's not family church's idea. It's God's idea. So if you're here tonight and you've never done that, again, I'm not going to make you stand up or come down front. I'm simply going to ask you to lift your hand. And when I see your hand, I'll have you put it right back down and then I'll lead us all in a prayer right there in your seat. You can pray and ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. But if that's you, could you just be bold enough for one second just to lift your hand? Does anyone here tonight say, yes, pastor, that's me. I want to be saved. I want to know that heaven's my home. If that's you, just lift your hand up long enough so I can see it. Is there anybody? God loves you. He's not mad at you. I don't see any hands. I just want to tell you, God's got an awesome plan for your life. Anyone before we are done praying that you'd like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Something on the inside of you is telling you to respond. I know sometimes it seems like, you know, the preacher is going to make a spectacle of you. Please know that I won't. Eyes are closed, heads are bowed. I just want to know who I'm praying for. It's an act of... You know, stepping towards God just to lift that hand. Is there anybody here that you know you need to respond and you haven't? Father God, I don't see any hands, so Lord, I just pray that, Father, if there's somebody within the sound of my voice that have never made Jesus their Lord, I pray that they would not leave this earth until they do. Father, we just love you. We praise you. Lord, we know what to do now. We know when that pressure is against us and those thoughts rage in our mind. We know what to do. We got to do it. And Father, we just give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's stand to our feet. Folks, I so appreciate you, you know, being patient. I know we went a little bit longer here tonight. But folks, it's good to be in a place where we get taught what to do. We need to know what to do. Let's just give God the glory and we'll be dismissed. Father, we just praise you tonight. We glorify you tonight. 
Lord, I pray your blessing upon each one that is here. Father, every family represented. And Father, we just give you all the praise, all the glory in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone shouted, amen. You are dismissed.